is Jess Wilcox. I'm the programs coordinator here at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out today on such a beautiful fall day and choosing to be with us. Um, and hear this pan fascinating panel discussion, Salander Bloomquist, Challenging Stereotypes. Um, it's also my pleasure to introduce um, and give you a few words about our extraordinary panelists that we have here today with us. First, we have Michael Kimmel, one of the best known experts on men and masculinity in the world, distinguished university professor of sociology at Stony Brook. He's the author of more than 20 books about men masculinity, including the bestseller Guyland, as well as Manhood in America, Men's Lives, Misframing Men, the politics of manhood, and the gendered society. And the brand new, just out, guides, Guy's Guide to Feminism. And as a little plug, I would like to mention that there will be a reading of the Guy's Guide to Feminism at Blue Stockings on Tuesday, November 27th at 7 p.m. I think there's a brochure outside on the tables in the antechamber that you can pick up if you'd like to find out more about that. Um, one of our second panelists who was slated to come, Shelby Knox, um, best known as the subject of the education of Shelby Knox, a Sundance Award film, award winning film, unfortunately is not able to be here uh, due to travel complications. But we still have as our third panelist, Jimmy Briggs, who we're pleased to have, the founder of Man Up Campaign, a global initiative to mobilize young people to stop violence against women and girls in their community through music, sport, and technology. Through extensive travels in Africa and the Middle East and Asia, Briggs has produced seminal reporting on the lives of war-affected youth and children soldiers, as well as survivals of sexual violence. He is the National Magazine Award finalist and recipient of honors from the Open Society Institute, National Association of Black Journalists for work in Uganda and Rwanda, and the Carter Center. His next book is The Wars Women Fight, Dispatches from a Father to His Daughter. And last, but certainly not least, is Linda Stein, who will be our moderator today. Um, she is an artist, activist, lecturer, performer, and video artist. The core of her work addresses issues of empowerment through gender justice. Stein's solo exhibition, The Fluidity of Gender, sculpture by Linda Stein, is currently traveling the country through 2013. Accompanied by her feminist lecture, The Chance to be Brave, The Courage to Dare, collaborative Stein gig performances by local community members and students, and exhibition catalogs. Stein is represented by Flomhaus Gallery in Manhattan and has her archives at Smith College. Uh, you can also see in the antechamber, she has a series of catalogs out there which you can feel free to browse through but are also available on amazon.com. So with no further ado, I will pass it along to this fabulous moderator and get the program going. Thank you. Good afternoon. How are you all today? Did you get caught in the two and three train uh, coming to Brooklyn? <laughs> Um, it's really a privilege to be here, and I want to thank Elizabeth Sackler first for all the work she does for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. She was brave enough to use that word feminist in the title of her uh, center. And um, Catherine Morris, Rebecca Taffel, Jess Co Wilcox, thank you very much, Jess, for all the work you did. Uh, Massa has been here, and Osario is handling the technical stuff today. And I want to thank our sponsors for taking part in this event by asking each of you to stand up and remain standing. And um, I'll call your name and your organization, and we'll wait to 
have a round of applause when all the people are standing. Is Tata Triori Rogers from the Estrella Foundation here? Allison Fisher from the Bella Abzu Leadership Institute. Joyce Whitby, Gloria Jacobs from the Feminist Press. Len and Ellie Flomenhoft from my gallery, Flomenhoft Gallery. Jimmy Briggs from Man Up Campaign. Joan Samelin from Men Can Stop Rape. The National Council for Research on Women. The National Organization for Men Against Sexism. Gabriel Korn from On the Issues magazine. Agatha Patterson from Third Wave. Voicemail magazine, Women of Color Policy Network. Stephanie Yasanda from Women's E! News. Thank you, thank you all, appreciate. So you have on your chair a couple of things, um, panelist introduction, and what I call a GARF. I bet you don't know what GARF is. GARF stands for Gender Alert Response Form. And I hope you'll take a couple of minutes afterwards to fill it out. You could do it anonymously if you'd like. Elizabeth Salander, Mikhail Blomqvist, two main protagonists from Stieg Larsson's Millennium Trilogy and the subsequent Swedish movies, two figures from pop culture who stand out as fictional characters who shake up, break up, unhinge, scramble, reverse, blend, blur, and challenge the binary stereotypes of masculinity and femininity, reaching and stretching toward a mobility and fluidity of gender, exploring beyond what is currently considered normal and acceptable, and opening the viewer to a multiplicity of emotions, of simultaneous fascination and discomfort. There is in this trilogy a frightening excitement, an ambiguous and complex overlapping of strength, aggression, power, and sexual energy. Issues of sadism intersect, slam into fears of being held down, bound, trampled upon, without agency, without defender, without selfhood. Come close at your own risk to the mesmerizing fantasies of omnipotence and libidinal domination or enter the terror of victimhood and vulnerability. Open up to your own oceanic waves of righteousness and transgressiveness. The oscillating feeling of being safe and then in an instant unprotected. In my art, I can deliberate on antithetical emotions like these. I can be stirred up and naked in my exposure to the inner turmoil that I'm only just beginning to let loose. As an artist, I can only be surprised by the relentlessness of my investigation and journey, the take no prisoners search and destroy need to reveal my own verboten emotions as I create icons representing gender fluidity sometimes with a femaleness that stands in for all of humanity, or sometimes looking to icons of strength and justice already in our popular culture. This is what brought me to this trilogy. So let's look at how these emotions play out in, say, this first story, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Let's see in the movie how stereotypes are challenged how the viewer is challenged to accept the blurring and scrambling of binaries. Now I'd like to turn to my distinguished panelists, Michael Kimmel, Jimmy Briggs, please come up on the stage and we hope we'll have an interesting conversation. working? We okay? Yeah. Okay. So, 
So Michael, let's start with you, Michael Kimmel, who'll speak on how McHale represents a new prototype for masculinity. Michael. Uh, thanks. Uh, before I do, I just want to say, um, that was wonderful. Uh, I, this is the first time I've seen it, so thank you. Thank that was fantastic. Um, I barely feel like I have anything to add to it. Um, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, an essay that I've, uh, talk off of an essay that I've written about whether uh, Blomquist represents uh, a new model of masculinity, and also talk a little bit about what some of the costs of that new model of masculinity might be. Um, the first thing I want to say, though, is that um, this, it, these novels, this trilogy, the um, perhaps the most widely read novels in the world over the past half decade, uh, you know, it struck some nerves. And I think um, one of the reasons that it struck a nerve, at least for me, is um, not sort of the sort of dark, cold, Swedish winter uh, part of it, but rather the fact that these seem to be leftist political thrillers. Um, the typical American political thriller, the Robert Patterson, Tom Clancy type, always seemed to end up resolving in a kind of Bushian, Cheneyan world of, you know, if you see something, say something, mutual surveillance, um, and a police state. Um, so I think that we liked, I think we kind of cottoned to the, the Millennium Trilogy in part because they were not only, um, it, because they were, I think, explicitly, um, you know, sort of at least social democratic, um, if not further to the left, but also explicitly feminist. Um, Larson himself is, uh, said, described himself actually as a feminist starting uh, as early as 1972. Um, and I just thought I would tell you one little story about something. Uh, after he was, um, after he had died, um, uh, in 2009, uh, his, par his life partner, Eva Gabrielson, um, cited a moment when, he, when his books won an award, cited a moment um, which she thought as was decisive in Larson's own development as a, as a feminist man. Um, in 2003, there was a very well-publicized murders of two women in Sweden a Kurdish woman um, and also a Swedish uh, model uh, were both murdered that fall. And the media continually stressed the difference between the two. One was an honor killing, the, the, the Kurdish woman was honor killing, something completely foreign to Swedish culture. And the, the, the model was a crime of passion, a homicide. Larson didn't buy that for a second. Um, he called them in an article that he wrote um, sisters in death. And he stressed, in, in fact, the similarities between these two murders of these two women. And this is what he wrote in an essay, him, this is what Larson himself wrote in an essay about these. He says, the forms of oppression differ, but not the cause of oppression. The forms vary dramatically between Sicilian honorary murders, burning widows in India, or battering of girlfriends or wives on Saturday nights in Sweden. The culture does not explain the underlying causes as to why the women of the world are being murdered, disfigured, circumcised, beaten, and forced into different forms of ritual behavior decided by men. The causes being that men in patriarchal societies oppress women. This is a systematic violence against women, for this is exactly what this is about, and it would be described as such a violence of the same proportions were it directed against trade unionists, Jews, or handicapped people. Feminism and anti-racism are two sides of the same coin. Now remember, this is a man writing in 2003. This is not Catherine McKinnon, not Andrea Dworkin, but perhaps the most popular novelist in the English-speaking world. Um, so it's really quite telling that he described himself this way. So in the first book, which is, mo which is I'm sure everybody in this room knows, the first book, tra literal translation, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo in, in English, was actually called Men Who Hate Women in its literal translation in Swedish. Um, so, and really it's a book about, uh, in some ways, a contrast of masculinities, using this punky feminist heroine, on the one hand, as a foil, and also pr pr you know, promoting a certain new model of masculinity in, in Blomqvist. So look at the evidence. There's, there's, there's a lot of male characters in this film, in, in, these, two, in these three books, sorry. There's the explicit villains, like 
like the sexually predatory legal guardian whom you saw in the in the in the video, um, his father, uh, her father, who uh, you know who she tries to murder in that scene and you know uh, pouring the uh, kerosene and then uh, lighting him on fire. There's her brother, who's a you know who's sort of a, a maniacal, cold-blooded killer. Um, all of these are hyper-violent, selfish. So those are the explicit villains. But actually, Larson spends a lot of time talking about the complicit villains, the Vonger family, the spineless bureaucrats like Bjork, the corporate miscreants, the, the immoral old world industrial tycoons like, like the Vongers, um, the corrupt police and CIA types like Gulberg. Um, the utterly, I mean, he has just, Larson is just dripping with contempt for Teleborian, the corrupt venal psychiatrist. Um, so these are, the, these are the foils. These are the men who hate women. And against this, he, po he posits um, Blomqvist as a kind of pro-feminist or proto-feminist -fe man. On the one hand, he's utterly ethical. Um, he's not at all exploitive of women. There's a scene early on in, uh, in, in one of the books um, in which one of the interns, a young, woman coming to the Millennium uh, magazine as an intern shows up at his apartment late at night and virtually throws herself at him and he rejects her. He's not exploitive, he's not predatory. He's obviously a competent lover. Um, Erica Berger, the, uh, the, the editor of, uh, of, Mill of Millennium, with whom he has a, an affair it, with the knowledge of her husband, this frees her husband to have dalliances with other men. Um, she's satisfied with their sex life. Um, but on the other hand, um, there's, a certain, there's some certain cost to this that I wanna, I wanna talk about. Um, I think there's a certain desexualization of this new Swedish masculinity in the way that Larson portrays it. Um, the, the affection that, that, Mike, that Mikael Blomqvist um, uh, exhibits is dispassionate. It's almost chilly and functional. Um, is this necessary? I, Larson seems to think so. But I ask the question, can pro-feminist masculinity also embrace a sexual desire that's neither predatory nor violent, but still remains hot? Um, I'm not so sure uh, that Larson would agree. Um, for example, uh, you know, it, it, the scene that you saw was the only time that uh, Elizabeth and uh, Blomqvist actually uh, have sex, so those, those two scenes um, when they're in the cottage together. And she spent, and, and then one day, you know, she buys him a Christmas present. This is in the first book. She buys him a Christmas present, and she sees him with Erica on the street. And she gets absolutely so freaked out by this. This is what Larson writes. He says, the pain was so immediate and so fierce that Lisbeth stopped in mid-stride, incapable of movement. Part of her wanted to rush after them. She wanted to take the metal sign and use the sharp edge to cleave Berger's head in two. She did nothing as thought swirled through her mind. Analysis of consequences. Finally, she calmed down. And you may remember if this, if this, this pivotal scene, she throws the gift into the garbage. Her momentary jealousy scares her. She's vulnerable, and she has made it her life's project to be utterly impenetrable. And she vows never, at this moment, never let anyone, including Blomqvist, back into her heart. It spent, she spends the next thousand pages, <laughs> right, the next three volumes, getting to a point where she can actually begin to trust him again. Um, and so what I thought I would do is just, I, I, I'm going to read a couple of passages about this because I think there's something to this. Um, Larson's answer um, comes, I think, closest to what you might call the sort of second wave writers on, on, on sexuality, uh, second wave feminist writers uh, like uh, Andrea Dworkin or John Stoltenberg. For them, like Larson, I believe, men's sexuality is inherently predatory, <laughs> violent, and oppressive to women. Erections signify domination, intercourse a violation, and occupation. Under patriarchy, women's heterosexual desire is collaboration. Lesbian sex can be liberatory, but only if it in no way resembles heterosexuality. Men's sexuality could be politically unproblematic only if it was denuded of what men had come to understand constitutes desire, aggressive, energetic, possessive. 
In a post-patriarchal feminist universe, gender equality in sex requires that men's sex come to resemble stereotypical feminine sex. This is not the case among contemporary third wave feminists and like Elizabeth Salander herself. One might even say that the pursuit of sexual pleasure is a feminist act. Third wave feminists have embraced a more masculinized sexuality, more agentic, more pleasure seeking as, a, as opposed to pain avoiding. The encounter between Elizabeth, the epigrammatic third wave feminist, and Michael, the emb embodiment of second wave pro-feminism encapsulates the dilemma. They constantly misinterpret each other. They vacillate between being lovers, friends, enemies, capture the contradictions of this particular historical moment, and provide part of the pleasure, at least for me, of reading the trilogy. Larson resolves this tension temporarily, and in a way, I think, that at least leaves me feeling unsatisfied. In the third volume, those of you who've read the three, Blomquist and Berger, Erica Berger, decide to end their affair. It's just not that, not anything wrong with it particularly. It's they both enjoy it. Her husband's accommodated himself to it. It's just that there's no magnetic attraction that is enough to sustain it. It's somewhat passionless. And look, let's face it, an affair without passion is kind of hard to sustain. <laughs> In the trilogy's final scene, the absolute end of the three books, Blomquist shows up at Lisbeth's apartment. Now remember, they've been lovers, you've seen it. But their affair was somewhat desultory, a bit of momentary comfort. He brings her, I, I like this being a Brooklyn boy, he brings her bagels and an espresso. <coughs> he announces that he is, quote, just company, unquote. Now, however, Lisbeth has done something she has not done before, feels something that she has not felt since she was a little girl. She trusts him. She, and he, and this is a quote, had in fact been a good friend to her over the past year, unquote. He was not a man who hates women. The cost, however, is their sexual relationship. This is a quote. She looked at him for a moment and realized that she now had no feelings for him, at least not those kind of feelings, unquote. She's no longer attracted to, to, to Blumquist as a lover. She's no longer vulnerable, doesn't love him like that. And when Lisbeth Salander opens her door and invites him into her apartment, she speaks for all the abused women who have shown themselves to triumph over their victimhood, who have steeled themselves to prove themselves resilient and indeed heroic. She also allows the possibility that the term feminist man is not an oxymoron, that men can be friends with women. Mikkel can actually become, quote, a man who loves women, unquote. He just can't have sex with them. Thanks. Jimmy Briggs. I was going to tell Michael every time I'm on a panel with him, I usually follow Michael, <laughs> and he always he always says things that has me scrambling, scratching Cross out that. notes, <laughs> putting things back in, trying to catch up, stay, stay and catch up with him, so that I can somehow um, add to. A, analysis he provided. Um, it's interesting, and I'm sure we'll get into this once we open the discussion up amongst the three of us, because you know, in a lot of ways my reaction to the, to the first novel, but the trilogy was, was somewhat different. Um, I don't know if I saw Blomquist as, as much as a, a proto-feminist, a pro-feminist as anti-masculinist, because one of the things, you know, throughout, throughout the series, but particularly the first one, um, you know, we see a very striking pattern. Um, you know, and, and, and we've, of course, it's, it's easy to see this trilogy and the character of Salander as uh, exercising some sort of revenge fantasy. But the thing about Blomquist that's very striking, I mean, he is a very moral upright person. Um, as a journalist, he protects his source, sources. He's very ethical. Uh, he follows, you know, he never leaks information. He follows, you know, trails to their, to, uh, somewhat satisfying end, but he never takes, um, he's never the one to take forceful action or respond in equal measure to, to any, um, to the violence that's happening around him. Um, that role was left for, for a cylinder. And I thought it was interesting, you know, especially, you know, Mike referred to the incident or the comments he made in 2003, and I, what I thought was interesting was Larson's own background. Um, some of you or most of you probably know that 
you know, in adolescence at actually the age of 15, he witnessed a gang rape committed by uh, friends of his. And he never reported that gang rape, nor did he try to stop it. And I, th I thought it was interesting reading the trilogy and then learning that fact because, you know, throughout, throughout the series, it, it felt like, to me at least, in many ways, that he was, this, that the character of, of Salinger was really um, almost a tool of redemption or, or um, you know, I, I guess a sort of a, a, a fantasy-based um, re-scripting re of what happened in his adolescence. You know, Linda asked me to talk about, you know, some of the parallels of some of the, some of the lessons that the trilogy and the character of Blomquist have um, in, in real society, contemporary society, particularly of late, um, with some of the most more high-profile incidents we've seen with harassment and sexual assault. And I thought, I mean, I'm sure this was intentional, but I thought it was interesting that we had this conversation, um, this specific conversation, in the context of the 20th anniversary of the Anita Hill testimony. Mm -hmm. um, because now, you know, you know, it's very much in all of our minds, those of us who can recall that time period and the troubling issues it raised, um, particularly with power dynamics um, around harassment and you know, the, the lessons or response of men. And one of the things I think, you know, Larson does, um, he, and in his context, he justifiably goes after the power structures. All the, the violence in these, in, these, in these books comes from very identifiable institutions of power, whether it's the Vonger family, this, this family dynasty, whether it's industry, whether it's sex traffickers, uh, whether it's social services who ostensibly are meant to protect, and the case, of Salander, they didn't protect, they, they actually fell through over and over again. But I, I, for me, I think that the, the, the series really sort of highlights the banality of, um, of misogyny and harassment. Because most of, you know, in the real world, every everyday real world, a lot of the harassment and violence that we see is, it is banal. Um, it takes very, I mean, very rarely, if ever, does it reach the levels that we see in these books. Um, where women are mutilated so graphically um, in, in great detail, as, as described by Larson, um, this banality exemplifies itself in how, in, in the workplace, uh, particularly work, workplaces where, where men are in the majority, um, and the, the discrimination, oppression women face in those situations, um, we saw it very strikingly in the Dominique Strauss Kahn case where you had a, a, male, a white male figure, a very um, easily identifiable villain um, in these dynamics, but you had some, a white male villain, and then you had um, a black African um, working class um, survivor um, who in the process, at least in, in terms of media representation, um, becomes voiceless as is typical in many situations of harassment or abuse, um, and Michael highlighted this, is individuated. And by that I mean, you know, a lot of times media coverage and, and readers uh, or consumers of that coverage, we look for reasons to explain why it happened in that particular case. What made this special? How, how was this person different from me? Um, what, you know, what excuses can I find so that, it be, it's a, what, so that what happened to this person or what, or what this perpetrator did um, is not the norm. And it somehow serves to um, affirm or provide comfort to you know, the majority of men who don't harass, who don't abuse, don't oppress, at least not overtly, but do nothing about it, who are apathetic or, or somehow power, powerless to prevent or stop it, much like Larson was in adolescence. Um, I'm going to stop there because I do have some more points, but I want to I want to um, actually respond to some of the things that Michael said mm -hmm. in the conversation. Thank you. Um, let's go back to Michael for a second. You talked a little bit about the proto-feminist. I I think it would be good to put a little more meat around that phrase. Can you? Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about what the proto-feminist would be like today? Uh, you, you mean like a, what pro-feminist masculinity? You mean uh, what it would be like now? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Um, let me be. Let me. Let me just say something about um, the term. Okay. Yes, that's where. Um, because I'm asked this a lot. I, I suppose you know other people. Joe, you're probably asked this a lot. Why don't you just call yourself a feminist? And and to me, um, uh, I think. Um, I've, I've thought about this a lot, uh, uh, you know, over the years in the organizations that I've that I've been involved with. Um, I call myself pro-feminist in part because um, I think to, that that feminism, uh, as a, a, you know, politically, um, feminism really requires that you share one empirical observation, and from that empirical observation, you make a moral, you take a moral position. The empirical observation is really easy: women and men aren't equal, right? That's the empirical observation. And you know, I would invite, I, I would suspect that virtually everybody in this room suspects that that's largely the case. The moral position is very simple also, and they should be. That's really all you need to support feminism. One empirical observation, one moral position. But to call yourself a feminist, I think for me, um, I always felt that that would be indulging in what I like to call premature self-congratulation. Um, it's kind of like, you know, uh, a little bit too hasty and a little bit too easy. Um, I think in order to be a feminist, one has to experience that inequality in a particular in a, in a particular way. And I don't. I'm privileged by gender I inequality, not not uh, not privileged by it. So it would be just as presumptuous for me to say that I'm a gay liberationist or a black militant as it would be to say I'm a feminist for the same reason. I think it would be appropriative. So rather than say that, I think, you know, look, I mean, men have, a, have, have an important place in, you know, in the movement for gender equality. I firmly believe that. Um, but I don't think we can be the cavalry. You know, I don't think we say, well, thanks for bringing this to our attention, ladies, but we'll take it from here. You know, I don't think we ride to the rescue. I think we are the gentleman's auxiliary. And I think that's a really honorable place to be. And so I call myself pro-feminist as a way to say, I'm the support network, I'm the cheerleader for this. But it's not, it, but it's not me, hmm. right? I don't claim to be that. Um, I, felt, I felt that way, I actually, I have to say, you know, when, I, when I was one of the founders of, of the National Organization for Men Against Sexism, you know, almost 30 years ago, I, thought, I felt this way. But I have to say, now, you know, feminism has come under such relentless assault uh, as, a, as a term for so long that I kind of loosened up a little bit about it. If a guy wants to stand up and say he's a feminist, I'm like, I'm down with that. <laughs> so. It's really interesting, um, as I go around to colleges around the country, and I really love talking to the students, but that word feminism is just such a hard word for them to put their arms around. And I, it's when we break it down and say, are you for um, equal pay for equal work? Every hand goes up, yes, I'm for equal pay for equal work. Are you for um, parity in, in the ability to run for office or something like that? Oh yes, everyone's for that. So then what's wrong with the word feminist? You, you know, everybody seems to embrace the word but have some difficulty with it. And Michael, you know, when you say an empirical observation and then a moral observation, I think that's great. I think that's really a great way of, of, of putting it because if, if people would, if men would say, yeah, we aren't equal and we start there, I think then there's a lot that can be accomplished after that. Mm -hmm. I, I like that very much. So Man Up Organization, Jimmy, do you discuss current events and what's going on with uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn and that he got off the hook in America and facing things in France and kind of probably will get away with it there too, but that's the short range. I think the long range effect of what he went through is going to be significant. Uh, for for women and for men going forward, is this the kind of thing you discuss uh, with your man up group? We, we do, and it's, I was just thinking about something Michael, Michael said that men can't be the cavalry because I agree. I don't think men should be the cavalry, but I, and at the same time, I think hmm, I have phrases. I, I think that men, you know, should and probably could easily say that. 
you know, there is, there's not, the equality does not exist. But I think that the, the issue is, that's not the issue, I think the issue is making, helping men understand, um, creating the space to understand and to talk about why they should care that, it, that, that there's no equality. Men know there's no equality, and, and amongst themselves, they may even be pushed to say that. But I, I think it's a matter of caring why there's not equality and what impact it has on them individually and collectively. Um, and it's really, you know, that's why I said the term before, anti-masculinist, which I think maybe could be synonymous with pro-feminist mm -hmm. when men say it, because I think we, that term anti-masculinist, it's really uh, upending and challenging um, what manhood means um, and, and, and really offering and affirming um, alternative masculinities. Mm -hmm. Not, you know, and you, you said it so eloquently, um, in, in the video presentation that you did, you talked about, you know, subtly and not so subtly how Blomquist's character, even by the way he dresses or how shadows present him in a certain way, mm -hmm. um, his, his physicality or lack thereof, um, how, how it challenges traditional notions of, you know, the male hero in yeah. so many Western films. Um, and it, you know, it, almost to the point where it, I won't say it, 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 it um, makes him weak or, you know, in terms of sexual terms, desexualizes him, but it really, it's, it's a very stark contrast to what we're normally seeing. In terms, to your question, in terms of Man Up, and even beyond Man Up, and, and Joe does similar in the, same, in the same work, in talking with young people, especially young men, adolescents, high school age students, a lot of times, you know, you, you're having to struggle against this overwhelming, consuming tide of, of pop culture, whether it's music or, or, or uh, literature, but especially yeah. visual pop culture, yeah. vid videos and, and movies, which um, affirms this, this, this traditional negative masculinity, um, which becomes very easy for them. And the more power, the, more, the less power they have, whether, you know, or perceive less power, whether it's because of color or economics uh, or geography, whatever, language, um, you know, what society tells them is that, you know, when everything else, if, if you can't achieve power in these other, other uh, pathways, financial, political, so forth, you always have your physicality and your sexuality. Mm. And that's what they hold, they hold on to that very tightly. Yeah. So it's really, you know, it's really a, a painstaking process. And, and I was talking to Joe before about how, you know, the work that his organization is doing, the wonderful work they're doing is intergenerational. Mm. Because it takes time to break down um, uh, that, that profound socialization that happens really from birth, especially for mm -hmm. young men. And Joe's organization again is Men Can Stop Rape. Michael, I, you I, wanted to, I wanted to just respond very quickly to something that you said, Linda, and then something that, that Jimmy has said both in his first uh, remarks and, and then just now. Um, the first thing I want to say is that, you know, you were talking, Linda, about, you know, going to college campuses and the, the sort of sense that, you know, f uh, that you get among a lot of young, young women that, you know, f well, uh, that feminism was, was, you know, my generation's issue. They say, you know, it's your generation's issue. We, we won. You know, we, we've inherited all of it. We can do anything we want. It's over. You know, and, and so you get this thing, and, and a lot of, a lot of um, you know, my colleagues, you know, fret over the fact that, you know, the, the constant phrasing is, I'm not a feminist, but... And then the but is, as you say, you know, they actually agree with virtually yes. everything. If you, mm -hmm. if, you, if you gave a kind of top 10 policy initiatives that feminism offers, they would agree with every one of them, Probably. but they're, they're not feminists. So, so right. I, I just want to say, I, I'm an activist and I'm an academic, and as such, temperamentally, I think, you know, as an activist and as, as an academic, as a, as a professor, I'm an optimist. You know, it's sort of, it's a temperamental position. You know, I have to believe the world can get better. Um, and um, and I, so I focus on the but part, not the I'm not a feminist part. But I agree with everything they stand for. You know, that's not so bad. You know, when it, the glass is still half full. And I think we, we, we often do ourselves a disservice um, by saying that we focus on the I'm not a feminist part of the phrase. But I want to say something else about something you said, Jimmy, that really struck me. You were talking about the banality, you, you gave the, used the phrase banality of harassment. In initially, and then when you were talking about um, Anita Hill, clearly, every you know we all recognize now, 20 years later, that that was a turning point in the conversation uh, about gender in the United States. You know that kind of overt, you know, kind of. I mean, you know, when that first happened, you may not remember this. They did surveys. Half of Americans believed her. Half of Americans believed him. 
You know now that it's like 88% believe her? The conversation changed as a result of her. And DSK, I think what you're saying is something really interesting, and that is the level at which his behavior, and this is uncontradicted, whether or not he did, you know, it was consensual with this maid or not, ridiculous, is he thought of, it, basically it came, it was a perk that came with his position. It was the routinization of that behavior in every single hotel, with every single female intern, with every single female you know, person that he came in contact with in any position. He thought it was a perk, as did Bjorman, the guardian in, in, the, tr in the trilogy, as does Teleborian. This, I, this notion that, well, of course I have sexual access to you. I have power over you. So it gives me that kind of routinized sexual mm -hmm. access. And I think if you're, I, I think you're right. I think you're onto something here that this may be a real turning point, not in the naming of harassment, but in actually exposing the routinized quality of men's sense of entitlement to women's bodies. And if that's the case, it will have been served an enormously salutary sort of function in pushing that conversation forward. 20 years from now, we're gathered here, and everybody says, you know, that DSK case, he got off, as did Thomas, he got off, but it changed the conversation. I think it'll have been a really valuable, you know, moment. But I, I told you I'm I an optimist. And I think it's important. Um, I was at that Anita Hill conference, and boy, it was fantastic. How many of you here were at that? It really was um, breathtaking, I think, in its reach going forward. Um, I think it's not only the men that accept male privilege, but the women. Look, his mm -hmm. wife said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so my mm -hmm. husband's a seducer. I mean, all mm -hmm. men, are, or all politicians, I think she said, are seducers. So we're all kind of buying into this ordinariness of privilege, male privilege. But I, 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 I was going to say the same thing, Linda, but it's true. Anita Hill's, oh, Thomas, Clarence Thomas's wife defended him. DSK's wife stood by and defended him. But I was going to say, even just here, you know, boiling down further um, here in this city, um, I think there are lessons that can be drawn, you know, and paralleled with Blomquist and, and Larson's, Larson's analysis through um, the emergence of the slut walk. And, mm -hmm. and, yes, and very it's very, very interesting, very interesting mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. um, you know, earlier this year, you know, two NYPD officers acquitted of rape. Of, a, of, a, of someone who was intoxicated, um, and there was a certain conversation around that. Um, fast forward several months, most recently, um, with the sexual perpetrator here in Brooklyn, and the remarks and attitude of some within the New York Police Department that women should, you know, not wear short skirts or they should cover their legs. And I think, you know, again, it goes back to that banality question of, you know, it's easy, it, it is easy to look at Clarence Thomas or Dominique Strauss Kahn. But I think the modality happens, and you know, the average person, and not just our attitudes, but how we do or don't support women, um, and their choice of dress, um, and, and their behaviors, and our reaction to, you know, amongst ourselves, those forces that would seek to dictate a particular gender role for them. Hmm. Yes. I. Um position to put all these baby blues on him and this black leather uh, and tattoo, which uh, Eva Gabrison, his uh, Stieg Larsson's uh, companion, uh, called warrior paint. So the, the filmmakers really went out of their way to reverse stereotypes. Um, would young men today or maybe older men see this as weakness, see Blomqvist as weak? Um, mm. uh, maybe passive, I don't know, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's hard because one thing is, you know, as I said before, he, he really, I forget the phrase that Michael used, he's really the auxiliary, he's an auxiliary support yeah. to Salander. Um, mm. I mean, he, he, he's, not, he's not the, um, he's not holding anyone accountable directly um, for the, the, this hyper surreal violence that they're committing against the female characters. I, I think this is a really, I think this is an empirical question, uh, being a sociologist, 
because as you know, you just watched clips from the Swedish trip, the Swedish movies, mm. and most of what you watched actually was from the book book one, the the first. It was the, all from book all, one. All from the first movie, right. um, because in the second movie she gets more punky and she sort of say, you know she shaves her head, she gets a mohawk, she she does a lot more. Um, so so in so this is the Swedish version, and um, and in this version you see Blomqvist. Uh, in baby blue, he's he's he cooks. He's with his children. Um, he's uh, you know he's very he, he's passive sexually. He lies there. She fucks him. You know um, uh, he he wants to cuddle afterwards. She doesn't. I mean, so he has all of these. Now here's the question. This is coming out in around Christmas time this year. It, around Christmas time will be the American version because oh, the Hollywood terrible. Hollywood does not trust the American uh, the, the American viewer to actually read subtitles. Um, so the so they're actually going to have a, a trilogy of these movies in an Americanized version. Right. So here's the question. Here's the empirical question: How will they image Blomqvist? Now it's clear that they that they have an ready-made audience of young women that they think that they can you know spike up and punk up Lisbeth. Right. But the question is, can they possibly get away with this Swedish, this Scandinavianized, nurturing, cuddly, passive masculinity, or will they have to butch him up? He's it's a my, really it's a so. really it's an empirical question, <laughs> and I offer it to you as sort of when you go to the movies, you know. Check check that out because he I, I I my hypothesis he's not going to be wearing a baby blue V neck. I agree with you. How many in the audience think they're going to butch Michael <laughs> in that next movie? And how many think that they're going to make more of a sexual object of Salander? Of I'm almost afraid to see the movie. All yeah. right, every, yeah. well we'll see. Come They'll December. Make it much hotter. They'll make it much hotter. be yeah. yes. Well, yes. they've already, they already done that. I mean, there was a controversy earlier over the poster choice. Um, yes. You know, in the American version, Rooney Mara, Mara who plays Salander, um, is you know the poster image is a very provocative, some seemingly sexual one, and also the casting of Blomquist. I mean, it's Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig is not this person in the Swedish yeah, in the Swedish yeah. interpretation. Yeah. And, and Even if he is in a, a, a yeah, powder blue it's, it's, Phoenix it's sweater, not be, it's not the same. They're gonna. They, I mean, they it's have Daniel fleshy. Craig, so that, you know, they're going to use Daniel his use his physicality. Otherwise, why cast him in that role? He's macho. Exactly. Yeah, really. I'm, I'm almost afraid to see this next movie. There's a part of me that doesn't want to see it, but then again, <laughs> you know, I'm curious, and just to be able to say how bad it is, I, I guess I have to see it. Uh, so this is extremely, extremely interesting. Um, so, so if we were to say that Mikhail is not weaker in this movie. He is, in fact, his ego is strong enough so he could wear baby blues and, and be a little bit more passive so that we don't use the word passive as a negative for masculinity. Mm. And we say that he can um, listen to her when she's smarter um, or more informed in some way, and that doesn't make him less manly. Are there other things that, that you would say for this new prototype of masculinity, or what we're, we're aiming for, what women would like? You know, <laughs> but from a man's <laughs> point of view, I'm sorry, Shelby's not here, she would yeah. offer a, uh, a, a, a 20s view of, of this also, but she's in North Carolina now, her plane got canceled. So um, if we were to define this really strong, um, positive masculinity, what kind of words would you use? Or, so that they're not weak, so that men don't feel weak mm. by this. I think I think uh, on language is something Michael said when you think about this when we were talking about pro feminist um, and feminist because uh, maybe passive passive isn't the right description mm, yes. for his character because right. that, that does con right. convey a, a, at least a weakness in character. Um, 
I meant sexually passive in that scene that we saw. Yes, that you know, was certainly. She walks in, she says, you know, she, and he's sort of like, what? You know, he's like <laughs> surprised, you know, like what's happening? And, you know, he kind of seems to get into it, but we're not clear, you know, she basically, she comes, she leaves. We're not sure what happened with him. You know, I mean, talk about gender reversal. You know, she doesn't even ask, was it good for you? I mean, she doesn't really care. <laughs> She's gone. And, and you know, so, right. so there is a way in which that's, he is yeah. passive sexually. And that's in that context. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but a little bit more throughout, because she kind of takes the lead in, um, in, in solving the, the mystery, and because she has this photographic memory, um, and, um, uh, and she's so assertive. I, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. so I remember I was trying to remember the name from yesterday. Yesterday there was a conference on masculinity. Uh, CUNY had it, the Grad Center. Anybody there from, uh, yes, I know Magda was there. Um, and one woman, Jen uh, Gabori, was the name I was thinking of. She, she said, um, she talked about, now I never saw it, Betty Draper on TV. <laughs> How many of you have seen this Betty Draper? She talked about her being an abuser and a bad mother. But she said there was something that, um, that women, fa a perverse satisfaction om almost, that women found and just another woman being powerful in, in the situation. I think that's one of the things that so many women find so attractive in this trilogy, that, uh, gee, finally, after you know seeing all those movies where the, the girl or the woman is raped or battered or victimized in some way, here is a defender yeah. with agency mm -hmm. and power and smarts, and like Wonder Woman, she doesn't have the, uh, the lasso and the magic um, uh, wristbands, but she has um, all these other accoutrements of power, this photographic memory. Michael? I, I was gonna say something, you, you know, uh, I, I think in a way, maybe we're, we're um, I think we're, we're, we're talking around something um, by talking about active and passive and agentic, and it takes them, you know, it takes them, you know, 1,800 pages. But by the end of the book, and if you remember how the different, how the different mysteries and, and thriller parts resolve, in book one, she comes in with the golf club, she rescues him. She's aware of his plight, she rescues him. At the, at the end of the third book, he yeah, rescues right. her. She's right. a, he's aware of her plight. He intervenes for her in a way that is quite unintrusive, but, but quite, you know, but, but helps. And maybe what we're really talking about here is mutual dependency that they have to both acknowledge. Second, that they are friends, and friends are equals. Think about friend. You know, we make friends with people who we consider our peers, not, you know, our servants and our bosses. And maybe that that is what 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 re it takes them eighteen hundred pages to actually get to the moment when he shows up at her apartment, and we're actually witnessing a, a relationship that is founded on gender equality. They are mutually dependent. They acknowledge each other's strengths. Um, there's no sexual tension any longer between them. Right? So it, in a way, it's the community of equals. You know, it's, you, know, you can fi fi pick your utopian theorists. You, know, you, you, know, you can go, go Jeffersonian. You, you, know, you can go anywhere you want. But it seems to me that that's the, sort of that, that community of equals. It's, it takes them a long time to get there. But they actually have recognized that they depend on each other. They need each other. And, it does, and needing doesn't in require power. I love that, and I love that about Stieg Larsson. Yeah. Now, could we have that between a husband and wife? Could we have that where <laughs> sex is involved? That, that's the goal, or one of the goals, anyway. How about if we, unless, Jimmy, did you have anything else you wanted to say? I, I, can wait. I, I, was, I, was, I guess for me, you know, I, I agree with Michael. I mean, one of the things that just really hung me up, and it, maybe partly because of my own personal experience with, with seeing violence against women, here and abroad, I, I guess I, I just was thrown by, by the violence at the end of the trilogy. Mm. Because I, I felt like, I, I kept going, kept wrestling with myself, 
you know, there is this powerful female figure, thankfully, but I'm, I wasn't sure about the message that Larson was telling hmm. women and telling hmm. men in the context of this violence. Yeah, I have this conversation with friends I respect a lot. And the conversation from that point goes like, why would women mimic the worst yeah. in men? You know, the violent part, why? And uh, it is a conundrum, uh, and I kind of wrestle with it myself. And that's why I said she defines herself, Liz Salander, by her own sense of morality. Um, hmm. So this is, this is a, a question of morality here, and I agree with those that say, well, why should women be violent like this? Isn't there another way? And I'm struggling with it. Maybe there'll be some answers in the audience. But Michael, did you want to say anything else? Of, no, otherwise, no. I'd like, if you would, be a little open with us. Uh, uh, how many have seen the trilogy? All th how many have seen all three? Okay, um, Ellie Flomenhoff, do you had a question? Well, I can't say it, but I've read the whole book. Okay. The title just came up in your discussion. It asked, what is the feminist man? What would a woman want a feminist man to do? That's great. <laughs> you made your point anyway, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah I think that's a very, very good point. Well, that's a great, great question. That's a big Jimmy? question. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big question. That's a big question. I think, uh, uh, Obviously, we recognize. I mean, it's not, maybe it's not obvious that, that justice is gendered. That you know, there there is obviously there, there there are levels of impunity, particularly as one, you know, depending on one's one's social social position and level of power. Um, you know, the, the degrees of impunity increase. I mean, I, I think you know, I, I totally forgot about the Martha Stewart case. I guess because in my mind, I, I, I'm, I'm distinguishing gender-based violations from financial ones. I mean, and, and I think there are examples of men going to prison as well for financial violations, but you don't see men, um, many men going to prison, especially at the higher levels of power, um, where gender is concerned or harassment or sexual abuse. And I think that's the problem because, you know, 
so many, I mean, from, from almost from birth, boys and then men are socialized um, that if you can get away with it, why not do it? And society has enough examples of men getting away with it, not just Dominique Strauss-Kahn, but everyday, every, everyday citizens. Yeah. I mean, women are so stigmatized against coming forward in the first place, uh, which is another reason why impunity is so profound. Um, but as we see in so many situations, most recently with the Dominique Strauss-Kahn, becomes a he said, she said. Yeah. You know, it's, and somehow um, the perpetrator's narrative uh, consumes that of the survivor. You know, we try to find any, as I said before, we try to find excuses for why, um, why this happened. It's, it's, you know, you know, Strauss Kahn, you know, was the president of IMF, um, potential candidate for president of France. There's no way he would, you know, sink to having to assault um, a domestic, especially a domestic from West Africa. Um, and that doubt starts to grow in your mind. And then, of course, you know, because she wasn't the perfect victim. You know, that gave us the easy out to, yeah. to kind of let it go away. And but Anita Hill the was the perfect victim. Well, I mean, she but, was the perfect witness. But, then, but then that was complicated by race, though. Yeah. You had but, a black right. man and a black woman accusing each other. Yeah. I, I, I just want to say very quickly, yeah. I think your point is really well taken. Um, I think, uh, it, you know, the Martha Stewart part, you know, it, it's... It's a little bit complicated because Martha Stewart held herself up as somehow a moral arbiter of how people should behave, should behave, and what good, you know, being a good nurturer, family, you know, family caregiver would look like. And we love to see people who hold themselves up as above us. We love to see them fall. So in a way, it was a little bit pushed by by that. But your larger point, I think, is quite telling. And let me offer a counter anecdote that illustrates your point also. Um, and the, the point I want to make is that sexism is still so much more readily permitted than even racism is. Um, so let me give you one illustration of this because I think it's part, again, of the routinization of this. You know, you shrug your shoulders, boys will be boys, this is what guys do. You know, everyone in, in power, this is how they behave. Now, some of you, you know, you probably, it, it's, it's hard for us in this, in this climate to remember that we actually had a primary um, competition in 2008, um, you know, before the, 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 the past three years of relentless assault on, you know, anything that resembled democratic politics. Um, and during the primaries, you may, do, do, does anybody remember this? During the primaries, um, it, it, there was a moment at, at a Hillary Clinton rally when two men held up a sign that said, go iron my shirt. Now, how many of you remember that from the mm. primaries into, Okay, a few of you, okay. Now, that's because it got virtually no media coverage at all. It was absolutely sort of passed, you know, quickly, but there were these two guys that held up a sign at a Hillary Clinton rally that said, go iron my shirt. Now, what I'd like to ask you to do for a moment is to imagine if two white guys got up at an Obama rally and said, go shine my shoes. I think every, it would have been front page on every single, uh, every single uh, newspaper, it would have been the lead story on every single evening news, and every single candidate, including John McCain, would have said, whoa, stop everything, that's wrong. Because racism is still at least somewhat more visible and somewhat less permitted than, than sexism. Sexism was so routinized that that passed without even mention. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that only four or five of you even remember the event. But I bet if that had happened in the other way, everyone would have known about it. Yeah, very good point. And if the Rutgers basketball players were mm -hmm. white mm -hmm. and Rush Limbaugh called Don them whatever, Don it would have had, what? Right, Don but the nappy-headed hose and that whole racist comment got tremendous yep. publicity. So Ellie, your, your point is, is very well made, and I think um, with DSK, most people believe that he has a history of committing wh whatever we want, womanizing, sexual abuse, I mean, there's various takes on it, but most people believe he at least has a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Some people call him an addict, some, you know, but uh, however they, uh, uh, one defines that. 
for oneself. But what happened with the um, woman was that they picked all these little things that she did wrong and forgot the big picture. That yes, this man probably did commit some kind of sexual assault in that room. Well, I mean, the, the, the survivor is held to a higher standard than the perpetrator. Mm. True. You know, he sure. could have had a lot of missteps in his background, mm -hmm. but, you know, because she made the mistakes, um, that was enough to, you know, to, 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 um, to, 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 to color everything. Mm -hmm. color everything. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Judith Law. Steve Glasson might be saying that um, that the uh, the new man of the day, whatever we call him, can be sought after by women and and not be um, not have all these macho qualities. I agree with you, mm -hmm. Michael. Did you have a thought? On um, that? Sure. I, you know, I, I I don't think that we disagree all that much, Judith. I think that the um, I think that the point that, um, that Larson is trying to make is exactly what Linda just said. You can be the new man, which is to say more nurturing, more caregiving, more cuddly, all of those things that we see. And, and in fact, that makes you even more desirable to women, <laughs> right? So, so the new man is, um, is, is, you know, certainly is no less desirable um, but I think that the, uh, but I, I think in the relationship with Lisbeth, he, he recognizes that in order to be the, 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 a real equal to her, he recognizes as well that he's just company, right? 
at that moment. And so, so that's all I was sort of arguing uh, at that point. I think there is a contrast in between the predatory, entitled, you know, violent sexualities of the other men who hate women, and then Blomquist on the other hand. And also, by the way, um, I think his name is Svensson, the journalist who's killed in the, in the, in the, in the uh, second book, um, who, has, who has a very egalitarian relationship with his graduate student uh, uh, partner. Right. Um, right. And, uh, they, you know, and it's quite explicitly stated that they're so gender equals. Um, so that's another case, another sort of, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a, uh, a case, uh, sort of an, a, an example of that new masculinity that, um, that Larson I I is trying to describe. As terms of whether or not, you know, I mean, I think it's a semantic, as I said at the end, it's kind of a semantic question at this point. What I think we want, I think what we need, are to engage men um, to step up and unrecognize that gender equality is actually in their interest as men, right? Whether they, what they call themselves in so doing is not as much of an interest to me as the fact that they do it. So the book that I just did with Michael Kaufman, The Guy's Guide to Feminism, um, is really a, a ba basically a book basically saying, you know, look, guys, feminism is not that scary. It's not really that complicated. You, even you can understand this, you know. And so we have a kind of lighthearted, funny book about it. And you know, it, it's just I think w the the point is not what we call ourselves in that engagement. The point is the engagement. Now, I think just as we're getting so many gender fluid terms. And, and gender fluidity is, is um, redefining masculinity and femininity. I, I think it will be um, so different for a, a kid that's four years old today when, when he or she becomes a teenager. It's going to be so different because I think our definitions of masculinity and what one needs to be masculine and the pressure we put on men you know, mm -hmm. men have this terrible uh, set of rules they have to follow in order to be manly. I think we're going to see a real change, and I think the book you wrote probably is going to help it a lot, Michael. Oh. Magda. Thanks. Thanks, Magda. I, I think, and thank you so much for your comments, I, I think several things, just going back a moment to the semantics conversation, I, I think um, I agree with Michael that it's really about the actual transformation over the, trans the, the semantics itself, but I think semantics do matter because, you know, at least with the, the, the young men that I work with and talk to, um, it's hard to say to them, you know, I'm gonna work with you to become a feminist. You know, they, they, they shut down. I mean, language does matter. And I think, you know, so often, especially in conversations like this, men or young men don't see it as relating to them because of language. Yeah. 
they hear certain buzzwords like feminism mm. or euphemisms like violence against women or interpersonal violence and they, and they become so gendered they feel like, you know what, it's not my issue, especially if they're not per- if they don't see themselves as perpetrators or abusers, they really don't feel like you're talking about them. And so I feel like, you know, the semantics of it does matter. I think we have to define, come up with our own, maybe a, a, a new term of, of for men who support and ally with feminists and with women and stand up, and stand up for and with women. But um, I, I think the, the issue, uh, your point is a good one, like the, in terms of parenting and, and mentoring, um, you know, and, and Jill knows this better than I do. I mean, we're really working against this huge wave. <laughs> This, this all-consuming, incessant wave uh, that drenches all of us, you know, ourselves included, on, on, with this negative masculinity and manhood. And you know, one of the things that I've been learning and, and we're doing with Man Up is you know, we keep going younger and younger. At first, we started off working with high school-age students. Now we're at middle school. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, in the next year or two, we'll be at elementary school. That's because great. personally, That's I feel great. like to, to start a conversation about equality, and, and leadership and advocacy with high school students, I mean, it's, it's a positive thing, but it's almost too late. Because by that point, they're adults, um, they've, been so, they've been socialized 16, 17, 18 years, um, it just takes that much more time to, to, to uh, enact the transformation. I think we have, at, from the beginning, uh, when they're boys and girls, we have to work with both of them, individually and collectively, um, in terms of interpersonal, interpersonal relations and issues of equality. Mm-hmm. And it has to come you know, from parents, but in the absence of parents, it has to come, it has to be reinforced by the society of that child. I mean, if we're, if we're going into schools, um, and Make and Stop Rape does this beautifully, if we're going to schools and working um, you know, with, through clubs, academic situations, the same message we're telling them in an educational setting has to be reinforced at home. It has to be reinforced on Sunday at church. It has to be reinforced by the peer group. It has to be reinforced by, you know, pop culture. It can't just be, you know, that hour once a week or twice a week because the, the message, it may not stick, it may not last. And the conversation has to continue. And um, as I went around to the colleges and uh, after a lecture, one guy raised his hand and said, okay, I get it. What do you what What do you want me to do? You know what What do you what? And this young woman raised her hand frantically and said, "Look, here's one thing you could do. Every time I go out on a date, the guy does all the talking. I'm not given a chance to say anything. He doesn't even care about what I do or what I think. One thing you could do." And then she stood up like this and said, "One thing you could do is just listen a little bit more." <laughs> And so the conversation and groups like Man Up and uh, whatnot is so, so important. And I have a question. Do you think this conversation is best held in gender segregated groups? Mm -hmm. Do you think the men open up more if it's boys only and the girls open up more if it's girls only? Or are you able in Men Against Rape and, and man up. Well, I guess yours is mostly a, a man's group, so it well, is yeah. segregated to that extent. Well, I, actually, I mean, men can stop rape and, and Jill should, should um, be able to space to stand up and talk as well. Um, but, I mean, man up is actually co-ed. It we're, is co-ed. We're with young men oh. and young women together. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So, but I know men can stop rape, it's mainly solely male. Kind of. <laughs> and Michael, do you find that as you go I, you around? Know, I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic on this question. Um, I've, I've gone around on it for, so, for such a long time. Um, I think it's different. Um, and so what I would add is, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it, it made perfect sense from the 1970s to now for women to get together and in sex segregated groups to talk about the kinds of experiences that they have. But it doesn't transfer willy nilly to men. In the same way that, of course, you know, people of color would get together to talk about race issues. But you know, if you have a kind of like white group, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a white group, it's different from having a whiteness group. Okay, and that is to say, if you have a group of white people talking about being white, what you end up is we have it so hard. 
It's unbelievable. Do you know what pressure it, it, we're under all the time? You know, and you know this as well as I do. In May, a big study, study came out that found that a higher percentage of white people in America believe that they are the victims of racial discrimination than black people. Um, so, 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 you know, you have no idea how hard we have it, man. So, uh, so that's what, now, and I think men's groups had that kind of same quality, which is when you get together, it becomes a kind of fetch fest. But a whiteness group takes as its core principle racial privilege and starts there and says, how does it feel? What is your experience of having privilege? Now, a, a men's group that would take as its core position, and I, I, I have an idea of how to do this, mm -hmm. a men's group that would take as its core moment of origin men's privilege um, would be, would, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. And the only way I believe we could do that is it had, if it had men of different sexualities, different mm -hmm. races, and different ethnicities and different ages. And the reason is because then people would not be speaking from positions of privilege exclusively, but also have some kind of movement yeah. between privilege and, 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 and uh, marginality. That, that would be, so, uh, so under those circumstances mm -hmm. only, mm -hmm. because you know, I'm asked this question all the time. You know, I testified for the government against, again, in the VMI and Citadel case, so people would ask me, are you against Wellesley? You know, and, of course, the answer is, you know, it's quite different when women, you know, for an all-women's college, you know, an all-women's group is speaking to women, it's a, it's a challenge to inequality. And an all-men's group can and often has been a way to perpetuate it. Yeah. So, so well, but, but I want to, can I just come back to one thing? Okay, that you said? and then I want to open it up. Okay, I, I did, I'm questions. sorry, I wanted, I wanted to address something that Magda said earlier yes. and something that you said as well. I, I'm, 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 the, I'm the, 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 the researcher, so I, I want to tell you, first I want to say that here's the bad news, then I have some good news. The bad news is this generation, the current generation, this is how much work we have to do, the current generation of college-age men subscribe to pretty much the same ideology of masculinity. If you ask them, we just did this, you know, some of my, 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 my graduate students are here, we just did this the other day in class. They, they had the same idea of what it means to be a man that I did when I was in college, that my dad did when he was in college. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable, you know, the sort of being stoic and shut down and strong and never crying and all that, all that stuff. So there's the bad news, that on the one hand, the abstract ideology of what they think it means to be a man remains relatively the same. Here's the good news, okay? I think you're quite right, Linda, in the sense that we are coming to a moment in which this, this, th these two forces are going to clash. On the one hand, they have very traditional ideas about masculinity if you ask them their abstract ideas about it. On the other hand, my male students, men of college age, survey after survey show, they expect, fully assume, that their wives and partners will be equally committed to their careers as they are, right? That they will have, you know, there's no more, you know, will you let your wife work from mad men sort of thing, not at all. Number, that's number one. Number two, they fully expect and assume that they will be really involved fathers, right? That's two. And three, they all have experience, and this is to my mind the biggest change going on among young people, they all have experience with cross-sex friendships. 25 years ago when I started doing this teaching, I would ask my students, how many of you have a good friend of the opposite sex? And I would get maybe 20%. Now if I get one hand raised when I say, how many of you do not have a good friend of the opposite sex? Hmm. It's a surprise. They yeah. all do. And again, my point about friendship is you make friends with your peers. They have the felt experience in everyday life of gender equality in a way that previous generations simply did not have. Now that's the good news. It's gonna clash with these traditional ideologies at some point. Yes. And I'm hoping yes. soon. <laughs> yes, and on the GARF that I hope you'll fill out, there is that question, do you have a cross-sex friendship? So I really am hoping you fill that out. There was a, uh, uh, yes. That's a good, very good point. Yes. Very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the, that's a good point. That's significant though. Yeah. Mm. yeah.
Yes, but it hit a nerve. It hit a nerve with women that were not abused as well, this movie and the trilogy. And I think that's significant. But we can't forget that she was an abused uh, person. Yes. 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 Yes, uh, yes, good, good point. point. Good point. Yes. Uh, I just want to note for Donna that she seems to be concentrating on kind of like just really like really violent sexual assaults and kind of um, other kind of violent acts of women in the work. She just sort of, and it's, it's almost like that also sort of ignores the kind of everyday violence that occurs, but it's not necessarily like physical or, or sexual assault or anything that kind of wrapped in the I think her point's a good one about the issue of trauma and, and gender, yes. gender violence and oppression. I mean, even, even within the movements, we don't really talk about, you know, the, how, how the response to those, those, those real concerns. I mean, whether or not you've been physically abused or emotionally, I mean, the, 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 it does affect, affect the relationships. Yeah. So you come from the... Yeah. PTSD. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We have five minutes, so is there? Yes, Joe. Last question, yes. Would that we could. Would that we could. I, I, like, I like the phrase, ma'am, that you used earlier when you said humanist. I feel like, I mean, that, that's, that says it all right there. It's self-explanatory. It's all encompassing. And I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Because I think this, the old language, a lot of times, it unnecessarily creates barriers to the work that, that has to happen. I have to say I don't. I don't agree. Um, and uh, just at, as, at the risk of you know, sort of ending this you know, with, a, with, with a little bit of controversy, um, I think it's giving in. Um, I think that the right wing has, you know, has claimed words like the family, to be pro-family is somehow to be sort of like anti-LGBT, anti-feminist. You know, to be pro-boy these days is to be anti-feminist. I'm, you know, I'm just reluctant to give up the word. Um, I think it's valuable, and I think it names something, and um, and I, you know, and I, I think it is part of humanism. In some, but I'm I'm just reluctant to give it up. I think you know I think it's I think it's giving in to the assault that has been that has happened to feminists and to feminism as an ideology by the Rush Limbaugh's of feminazi world. And 
I, I just won't give up. I won't give it up that quickly. But, but if, we're, <laughs> if we're asking men to evolve and transform, why can't the language evolve and transform as well? I mean, why, why, why should we hold, you know, ask men to change, but then maintain these definitions from 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? I think we, I think we change the content, not necessarily the form. I think we say that, that we say to, to men, you know, you don't have to give up being a man. You don't have to give up masculinity in order to embrace equality and, ju and gender justice and, uh, and, and sexual equality. You don't have to. In fact, what we need to do is instead say, you know what, the package of being a man actually includes things like doing the right thing, speaking truth to power, having integrity, behaving with honor. Those are part of what I, you know, for me, when I was in sixth grade, I remember reading, reading Profiles in Courage. It was a book that changed my life. You know, it, I read that book and it, and it was about men who stood up, did the right thing, and in every case it cost them. They didn't get reelected, they didn't get, you know, something, and I thought, that's what men do. They stand up and, to, and, 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 to, and do the right thing, even if it costs them. But we can make yeah. it, you know, so I'm saying let's, let's change the yeah. content, not yeah. necessarily the package it comes yeah. in. But those, I mean, dignity, integrity, honor, courage, strength, those are transcendent terms. Absolutely. Feminism yeah. is not a term that transcends for a lot of men, but, but I think or for men, most men. I agree, but I, what I'm saying is that those, so, so you, you know, you, you fill the, the word with a new content rather than just say, okay, the package is wrong, let's use a different one. I, I mean, this is a great conversation, and obviously we won't resolve it today, mm -hmm. but, but I, I just, I wanted to throw, a, you know, a wrench into the, a kind of a, a, an emerging consensus that we all just want to get rid of the words. Okay, I think we, on this note of passion, <laughs> I think we have to uh, thank Michael Kimmel very much and Jimmy Briggs very much, and thank you very much for coming out here today. And please fill out the, the forms. And um, uh, Henry, would you stand, please, and just on the, at, go to the back of the room and give them to Henry. Thank you. Have you gone to the Senate? The Senate? The Senate?